Christian died Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ in vain He suffered by his death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints That history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman Pope ruled the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say by the same faith we live today. On News Radio. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour, and or rather the next two hours, as a matter of fact. We're reading and discussing the book Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness, one of the great Protestants of the age, and he dispels futurism, this idea that the Antichrist is a single individual that comes at the very end of time, just before Christ's return. This is not a Protestant view. This is a Roman Catholic view. It was the goal of the Roman Catholic Church, and particularly the Jesuit order, to destroy the teaching of Protestantism. The teaching of Protestantism is that the papacy, the office of the papacy, and every pope throughout history was the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the Bible. That's what all the Protestant reformers believed. That's what all the Protestant reformers taught unanimously. There was no exception. As a matter of fact, if one did not believe that the papacy was the antichrist of the Bible, the Antichrist of prophecy, that's spoken of by the prophet Daniel, the apostle Paul, and the apostle and prophet John, then he was not a Protestant. It was the unanimous Protestant view. It was the very foundation of Protestantism, the belief that the papacy, the office of the papacy, and every pope that occupied that seat of authority in the world as pope was the Antichrist of the Bible. Now, <clears throat> because I missed last week, and it's been two weeks since we've been together, we're going to retreat a couple of pages. We, had, we concluded last time on page 90 of the book, we're going to back up to page 87, the first full paragraph on the page, page 87. And we're still talking about Paul's prophetic foreview of Romanism or the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. What Paul saw for the future was the rise of the man of sin, the son of perdition, <clears throat> the Antichrist of the Bible. He saw the same entity that the prophet Daniel saw, and he describes it in terms that we cannot mistake. Now, let me reiterate a very, very important point. 
that I've made before, but it needs to be restated again and again so that we never forget. God wrote the Bible so that we would know who our Messiah is. It even prophesies the very words that he would say on the cross. It describes his life, his work, his mission of redemption, that he would be born of a virgin, that he would come of the lineage of of David, and that he would die and suffer for the sins of the world, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He was our Messiah. God, in all of his efforts, made sure that there was no excuse for anyone to miss their Messiah. God wants us to be saved. He didn't play games with his people about who the Christ would be. And we all know it was Jesus, and no one could ever confuse us about that. But it is Satan's business to do that very thing to confuse us about who the Savior is. And likewise, we need to understand that God does not want us to be deceived by that deception. Now, you you simply have to ask yourself, if God went to so much trouble in his scriptures to see to it that no one had an excuse to miss the Messiah, why would he leave us in jeopardy of believing the deception? Why would he leave us? Why would he deal treacherously with the people for whom he came and died to save? Why would he leave us in jeopardy of being mistaken about the man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist of the Bible? Common sense dictates that if God wants us to know him and to know his Christ and to receive his salvation, he also wants us to know who the Antichrist is. Now, we live in a generation, unlike that of the day of the Protestant Reformers, when most Christians are oblivious, if not conflicted, about the identity of the Antichrist, when no Protestant doubted in his mind any more about Antichrist than he did about the identity of Jesus Christ. They were sure in their salvation in Jesus Christ. They were just as sure about the identity of the Antichrist. God does not deal treacherously with his people. But the whole Christian world today would have us believe either it's Barack Obama or it's Javier Solana or it's some guru in the East. Anybody, Donald Duck could be the Antichrist. Or even, as I've even heard from one of my own family members, quote, We're not supposed to know, unquote. We are supposed to know. God made sure that we did know who this Antichrist is, that no one would have an excuse not to know who this Antichrist is, and the Protestant reformers to the man, every single one of them, without exception, it was unanimous. Just as Christ meets the prophecies, just as Jesus met and fulfilled all the prophecies of Messiah, the Pope of Rome meets and fulfills all the prophecies of the Antichrist. And that is the mission of Henry Grattan Guinness in this book entitled Romanism and the Reformation. We are not part of the current quote-unquote, Christian world that is confused about who the Antichrist is. The whole world is confused or at least conflicted about who the Antichrist is. Imagine the whole Christian world is deceived about who the Antichrist is 
when God left no excuse not to know who it is. Even so far as they would tell us, we're not supposed to know who the Antichrist is. We are not part of that deceived Christian world. We read the prophecies of Daniel. We read the prophecies of Paul. We read the prophecies of John. We see in history its fulfillment, just as we saw in history the fulfillment of Christ in Jesus we see the fulfillment of Antichrist in the papacy. And after we've thoroughly devoured all the information now that's available from Protestant writers, we have no excuse to be deceived or confused or conflicted any more about the the identity of Antichrist than we are about the identity of our blessed Savior. God, again, God does not deal treacherously with his people for whom he shed his blood. Now, let us devour the information that this God-fearing man gives us, this Protestant man gives to us, and let us take it to heart and examine it and own it. We have to own this information. It has to be just as much a part of us as is Christ, because there is a spirit of deception in this world that mimics the power of God, not to reveal the truth, but to hide it and to deceive God's people. And nearly the entire Christian world today is deceived. You must not be deceived. Now we'll begin on the first full paragraph on page 87 of the book. Just prior to this particular uh, uh, paragraph that I'm going to read, Henry Grattan Guinness makes it perfectly clear that according to the language used in Scripture about the Antichrist, It is not descriptive as to whether it is uh, uh, the the Antichrist is a dynasty. Now, common sense dictates that if the man of sin or the mystery of iniquity, which is the equivalent, was already at work in Paul's time, and prophecy also clearly indicates that that mystery of iniquity that spirit of Antichrist would exist until Christ's second advent, then it must be a period of thousands of years because Christ has not yet even returned. And we see in the world it is still in existence. It cannot be a single individual because no single individual lives to be 2,000 years old. Therefore, it must, by necessity, be a dynasty of popes. No single pope fulfills the prophecy of Antichrist, but the office of the papacy. That includes every pope that ruled under the Roman Catholic Church is the Antichrist spoken of by the prophets. It's not one single individual, as the futurists would have us believe. He says in the previous paragraph, it neither the language spoken of in the Bible regarding this, this, this Antichrist figure, it says it neither asserted nor excluded a dynastic meaning. Okay? So the language leaves it up for history to determine if the, po- if the Antichrist is a single individual or if it's a a dynasty of individuals throughout history. All right? History, 2,000 years of it has passed. So we know it cannot be one individual if it was already at work in Paul's day, and it won't be destroyed until Christ comes the second time, which has not yet happened after 2,000 years, then we know it must be a dynasty. 
this antichrist figure must be a dynasty of kings. Now, remember, it speaks of the Pope as a king. Well, kings die, but the kingdom or the office of the king never dies. So in the language of prophecy, we have to understand that it's talking about the kingdom of Antichrist, the, the reign of all the popes in succession. Now I'll begin reading. It says, bearing this in mind, let us now look at Paul's prophetic portrait of the great anti-Christian power he foresaw and foretold. It's a strange one with Mark and most peculiar features. He is represented as seated in the temple or the house of God. For instance, the church. Quote, the habitation of God through the Spirit, unquote. God's dwelling place, a sacred sphere, the most sacred on earth. Now I'll stop and comment. We know from the scripture that this apostasy, this great apostasy, this antichrist system would rise up out of the church, out of what is believed to be the Christian church. And this is verified in other passages of scripture. It says Satan is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it should not surprise us if his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. God is clearly telling us that the power of Antichrist, if it is to deceive God's people, it must come up in the church. It must appear to be a Christian church in order to deceive God's people. And we find in the papacy that's exactly what happened. The papacy is the Antichrist, and his ministers, his priests and bishops, are likewise transformed into ministers of righteousness. They appear to be Christian, but they are not. They are servants of Satan. This is the belief of the Protestant reformers. If you are a Protestant, you believe this. If you don't believe this, you cannot legitimately call yourself Protestant. Now, speaking of this Antichrist figure, this apostasy that grows up in the church, this man of sin, the son of perdition that Paul, uh, that Paul is speaking of, rises up in the church. And he says, there in the midst of the church, exalted and enthroned, sits a sinful mortal, an enemy of God a quote-unquote man of sin engaged in receiving from a multitude of deluded apostate Christians worshipful submission and adoration. Beneath him, the Pope, like a dark cloud or vapor out of which he has, which he has risen, is a quote-unquote mystery of iniquity. There is a chronological date upon the cloud. Close examination shows inscribed on it the words, quote, doth already work, unquote, indicating its existence in Paul's day, 18 centuries ago. On one side lies a broken, <clears throat> excuse me if I can get the page to turn here. What's the matter with my computer here? One minute, please. Okay. On one side lies a broken arch covered with Roman sculpture. This arch had at one period blocked away from the dark undercloud to the exalted seat occupied by the man of sin. In Paul's day, it stood firm, a massive hindrance. But he foresaw that it would be, quote, taken out of the way, unquote. Now, who's he talking about? Who ruled Rome at the time when Jesus and the apostles were upon the earth? It was the Caesar, right? He ruled the known world, the Roman Caesar. He even ruled in Jerusalem. And the Roman Caesars 
and his representatives in Jerusalem, together with the apostate Jews who said, we have no king but Caesar, together they crucified Christ, our Messiah, the one spoken of in Scripture, the one in whom we are saved. But this Caesar, before the man of sin could come to power, this restrainer had to be taken out of the way. This hindrance had to be taken out of the way. Caesar had to be taken out of the way. His seat had to be vacated so that the Pope, the papacy, could then occupy that chair. And the dynasty of the popes began. It says, in Paul's day, it stood firm, a massive hindrance, talking about the Caesars. But he foresaw that it would be, quote, unquote, taken out of the way. By some mighty stroke, it has been rent and lies in fragments. The barrier has been taken out of the way. Through the ruinous gap, the mystery of iniquity has come up into the holy place in the form of, quote, all deceivableness of unrighteousness. So who occupies that seat of the Caesars? It's Satan himself and his representative on earth. The human agency through which Satan rules is the papacy. The the all deceivableness of unrighteousness certainly is satanic, and it is manifest and visible on the earth in the form of the papacy. Now, he says, mingled with a vast mass of deceit, there are certain leading lies which are firmly believed and many lying wonders. So lying and deception will define this man of sin that Paul's talking about. Now, he says the countenance or the appearance of the man of sin is marked by pretended sanctity. There is in it a look of elevation marred by pride. The features are full of power and intelligence. His head is circled with a crown of peculiar form, unlike that worn by any ordinary kings, and upon it is the title, quote, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Unquote, implying that he is ruler both of the church and of the world because he is as God on earth. Now, I'll stop and comment. In numerous papal encyclicals, it is acknowledged in writing by the papacy that the Pope is, as it were, God on earth. They even address him in these papal encyclicals and papal bulls as most holy father. Also, vicar of Christ, which means replacement of Christ. Who replaces Christ? Nobody. Christ has no vicar. Unless, of course, you want to accept the Holy Spirit as his vicar or replacement, Jesus did say, I must go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I go away, he will come and teach you all things. And we know that to be the Holy Spirit. So if there is, and I should state there is, a true vicar of Christ, it is the Spirit of Christ and not the Pope. He's called, the papacy is, 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 calls itself Lord God the Pope. And the papacy has never backed away from that self-proclamation, thus fulfilling the prophecy regarding the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist, that he would pretend to be a friend of Christ, but instead would attempt to replace Christ and get everybody to bow not to Jesus Christ, but to himself. And that is no better fulfilled in the papacy than anyone else. There is no other candidate on the planet that fulfills that prophecy better than the papacy. There's not even a candidate. See, God does not deal treacherously with his people. 
He leaves us no excuse not to know who the Antichrist is. I'll continue now with the reading. He says, his hand, that is the hand of the Antichrist, is lifted in the attitude of one bestowing divine favors. And we've all seen the, you know, the photographs of the papacy holding up his hands with the, with the votive sign, the three fingers, <clears throat> known as the trident to some, the thumb, the index finger, and the middle finger representing the unholy trinity, if you want to know. And the author speaks of it. It says, his hand is lifted in the attitude of one bestowing divine favors. His semblance is that of benignity and blessing, while the spirit of the man is that of the great adversary. Behind him, behind the Pope, half concealed, is a dark figure, difficult to make out, with a face full of malignity. There is a gleam of defiance in his eye and a deadly purpose in his aspect. He, too, wears a crown, and the name written on it in yellow, sulfurous letters, is, quote, God of this world, unquote. That's Satan himself. Now, Henry Grattan Guinness, like all Protestants, has just assigned the papacy as the human agency in front of Satan himself. Satan himself manifests himself on the earth visibly in the form of a man, just as God represented himself on earth in the form of a man, the man Christ Jesus. Satan counterfeits and represents himself also through a man, the Pope. Now he says he stands close to the man of sin, speaking of Satan, too close to be seen by the worshiping multitude, directing and inspiring all his utterances and all his movements. With extraordinary skill, he wields a worldwide power through this chosen agent, the papacy, a power which has been exercised in various ways for 6,000 years, deluding men to their destruction but which reaches its climax in this combination of satanic craft with, and I will include the words for the first time in history, combining satanic craft with ecclesiastical exaltation. The church is elevating this man of sin, this satanic craft in the papacy. And it says, by the mouth of the man of sin, he speaks to the multitude, thronging the holy temple or the house of God in a tone of authority, commanding them to submit to his teachings and his guidance and to abase themselves in his presence. Let me tell you, every king, queen, and potentate on the face of the earth goes to Rome to personally visit with the papacy, and they do so on their knees. And if they don't do it on their knees, they must wear black. And the women must wear veils as a sign of submission to the papacy. Now, any one of the listeners here can go to Google Images and type in the word Pope, And then the name of any president, any king, any queen, any powerful person on earth, and hit enter, and you'll see photographs yourself of the most powerful kings, queens, and potentates on the earth, including the president of the United States, and especially the president of the United States, either before the pope on their knees or wearing black and veils if they have to be if they happen to be bringing their wives or daughters along. You see it for yourself. It's a sign of worship. 
It's a sign of submission. It's a recognition of the authority, the supreme authority of the Pope over their lives, both their private lives and their professional lives. There's no mistake about it. Any man who bows down and kisses the ring of another and wears black and, and, and behaves in abeyance to the papacy is demonstrating worship. And any president of the United States, any king or queen of any other country who goes to Rome and bows down to the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the Bible is not worthy to govern men of God. Else we find ourselves betraying our only ruler. And joining those who are deceived. We are not to bow down and worship sinful, wicked men. We are to bow down and worship the Holy One and no one else. But you can see them for yourself, all bowing in submission and obeyance, believing his teachings, receiving his guidance, and abasing themselves in his presence. And we have to ask ourselves, how much loyalty, how much patriotic feeling should we have to governors and kings and queens and potentates and presidents who do such blasphemy in the sight of cameras to be placed on Google images and viewed by every man, woman, and child on the planet? How much should we revere the most powerful people in the world who would stoop so low and blaspheme against Christ and God and bow down to a mere man, a sinful, wicked man behind whom Satan stands fully in control. Therein lies just a glimpse of the apostasy of this entire world. If it sinks to the marrow of your bones, then you can comprehend just how deceived this world is. If contemplated too long, one begins to ask ask himself, who's saved? It's a good question. But by the mercy of God, we have received the truth in this book. It parallels the Bible. It reveals the historical fulfillment of this man of sin. And we are to examine it, study it, and prove it to be true, and then tell everyone else that we know. He continues, he says, his words are, quote, fall down and worship me, unquote. The very words that Satan used before Jesus Christ in his 40 days of temptation. See all the kingdoms of the world and all the glory of them all? I will give them all to you if you just bow down and worship me. Well, Jesus was not going to be Satan's human agency on earth. Jesus was not going to be the Antichrist. Jesus was not going to be the Pope. He was going to prove himself to be the Savior, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, and he rejected Satan's offer, and he went to the cross. He humbled himself before God and took upon his body our sins and bought our, bought our souls and made us free. But Satan wasn't satisfied. He had to find a human agency through which to achieve his grand deception. And Satan just simply turned to the papacy. See all the kingdoms of the earth and the glory of them all? I will give them all to you if you will just bow down and worship me. And that's what the, what the papacy does. And likewise, the papacy requires the kings of the earth, to bow down and worship him because he is the human representative 
of none other than Satan himself on the earth. Now he continues concluding this paragraph. He says, the deluded multitude, and I will use the word Christianity, the deluded multitude blindly obeys him as though his voice was the voice of God. That's the situation in the world today. The deluded multitude blindly obeys him as though his voice is the voice of God. Why do the kings of the earth bow down to him? Because they believe that he is the voice of God on earth. Now, under the feet of this man of sin, under the feet of the papacy, in other words, his foundation upon which he stands, upon which he treads, are two venerable volumes, two books bearing the titles, quote, Laws Human and Laws Divine, unquote. He is trampling on them both, treading them underfoot. Some in the crowd are pointing to this fact and stand in a protesting attitude. Does anybody care to tell me who those people would be? those who would see the papacy treading on the laws of God and treading on the laws of man and standing there in a, an attitude of protest, protesting this abomination, this blasphemy. Who can change God's laws but God only? So if the papacy attempts to change God's laws, He is claiming to be God. And we know history leaves no room for doubt that in 321 A.D., it was the Roman Caesar who changed, transferred the solemnity of the biblical Sabbath, the seventh day, to Sunday. That act of the Caesar is still extant, and nobody disputes it, because it's historical fact. The Caesars, before the rise and reign of the papacy, transferred the solemnity of the seventh day to Sunday, and when the Caesars left their throne, left the restrainer, the restrainer left the throne and gave it to the papacy, the papacy claimed that distinction for itself. That because the Pope's reign in the place of Caesar, virtually acknowledging that the Caesars were the restrainer, the ones who restrained the rise of the papacy, that the papacy now does in fact sit in the seat of the Caesars, and therefore is that power that came up after the Caesars has claimed to be Caesar and that it it was his prerogative to transfer the solemnity of the seventh-day Sabbath to Sunday, the venerable day of the sun. And no one disputes this. Even Protestant churches acknowledge that it was the Caesar in 321 A.D. who changed the Sabbath. And the Pope says it's the prerogative of the Caesar and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Pope of Rome to dispense with God's law altogether. It says so in papal encyclicals that can be read by and researched by anybody. Again, proving that the papacy is the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist because he thinks to change God's times and laws. Sabbath was a time, the seventh day, and it was also a law, and the papacy changed it and insists that it now is the Sabbath, and God's people know better. One other note 
<clears throat> about this Sabbath law, God's Sabbath, the seventh day, he said, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, neither thou, <clears throat> nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord created the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested, and he hallowed it, made it holy. Now, if God established the seventh day and made it holy, what sinful, wicked man, whether he be the Caesar or the Pope, could change the day without marking himself as Antichrist? And something else unique about that fourth commandment, it's the only law God ever wrote that has his title, his jurisdiction, and his signature. Look it up. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. The creator created all heaven and earth, didn't he? That's his title. That's his office. And he created a law to be observed on the seventh day. All heaven and earth is his jurisdiction. And his signature is there too. Creator. He created heaven and earth. There is no jurisdiction outside of heaven and earth. There's no jurisdiction for a pope. Never in anywhere in God's word is there a jurisdiction set aside for the pope. You may not go outside of the creation of God into another domain ruled specifically or exclusively by the papacy. So one can only conclude that changing the Sabbath from the seventh day to Sunday was not God's doing, but Satan's doing through the papacy. Sabbath is a time and a law. How specific could the scriptures possibly be in identifying who is the man of sin and the son of perdition? Now, he says, far below, far above, a perfect contrast in every respect to the self-exalting man of sin is seen the self-humbling and the self-sacrificing son of God. He, too, is seated, seated on a radiant throne from which celestial glory is streaming. His attitude is that of one coming in judgment for the destruction of the man of sin and his sinful worshipers. Many of the protesters are looking at him in anticipation of this advent and seem to have something of his likeness. The man, of, or rather the face of the man of sin is the face of a false apostle, the dark face of a Judas. Now, what do we know about Judas? He was one of the 12, wasn't he? He was thought to be a friend of Jesus. He carried the money bag, did he not? And yet, he sold his Messiah, sold rather our Messiah, for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. He betrayed him with a kiss. <clears throat> Is that not what the papacy does? Pretends to be a friend of Christ? Betrays him with a kiss? And sells him? For money, some might describe some of Protestant churches today in that respect, too, and I'd have to agree with them. Judas priests, every one of them. Now he continues, he says, written upon the wall of the temple in letters of light, just above the proud, false, central figure is the name Son of Perdition. 
The man of sin is a Judas, a secret enemy while a seeming friend, a familiar friend, yet a fatal foe who betrays with a kiss and a hail master. There are several features in this portrait which I must ask you to especially to take notice. Observe the place occupied by the man of sin, the temple or the house of God. This is not and cannot be any Jewish temple. Did you hear that, all you futurists out there that may be listening? This is not and cannot be any Jewish temple that Paul is speaking about. Paul, who uses this expression in his prophetic portrait of Romanism, employs it both in Corinthians and Ephesians with reference to the Christian church. In this, not a Jewish temple, the Christian church. Remember, the apostasy comes forth out of the church. It's, it's an apostasy. Well, if it comes outside, if it comes from outside of the church, how could it be called an apostasy? God left us no excuse. The great delusion, the great deceiver comes out of the church. It says in the second epistle to the Corinthians, writing to Gentile Christians, he says, quote, Ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and make and walk in them, unquote. So where is the body of Christ? Where is the temple of the living God? Each and every one of us are the temple of the living God. He no longer dwells in temples made with hands. Where does that leave the Pope? Dead ringer. Is it like the Christians say today that God that that God deals treacherously with these people, leaving us in doubt as to who could be the Antichrist? The Scriptures certainly do not leave us in jeopardy. He says in Ephesians, he calls the church quote a holy temple, a quote habitation of God through the Spirit unquote. And he would never have applied that to a Jewish temple, which with all the other Jewish things he regarded as mere shadows of Christian realities. To Paul emphatically, the temple of God was the church of Jesus Christ. This is the temple in which his prophetic eye saw the man of sin seated. It is no question of his bodily location in any structure of wood or stone, but of something far higher. The temple of God is that, quote, spiritual house, unquote, in which he dwells, Christ. It is built of, quote, living stones, unquote, of true believers. It is here. It is here that the man of sin was to usurp the place of God. This is the quote-unquote mystery, the dread danger, the deadly evil predicted by the apostle. It is no person in a temple of stone, but a power in the Christian church. Observe next the character of the man of sin. He is at once an imitation of Christ and a contrast to him. He occupies his position but is totally unlike him and opposed to him. He has usurped his place and his prerogatives. But so far from truly representing him, he represents his great enemy. As Christ acts for God, so the man of sin acts for Satan, who indeed produces him for this very purpose. His coming is, quote, after the working of Satan, unquote. So there you have it, right in the scriptures. He comes after the working of Satan. The man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to rise up in the church, but he's going to be working for Satan, just as did Judas. Continuing, he says, Christ and he 
are antagonistic powers. In other words, diametrically opposed. The power of light and the power of darkness. The majesty of heaven and the might of hell. And as the Son of God humbled himself, so the man of sin exalts himself. There is infinite self-abasement in the one, the divine nature stooping to humanity, and the infinite self-exaltation in the other, the human and satanic assuming to be divine. Compare and contrast Christ with the papacy. You can't come to any other conclusion than the one that Henry Grattan Guinness has just drawn. While the papacy claims to be a friend of Jesus Christ, he is none of his. Neither his character, his appearance, his office, his trampling all over God's law, his trampling all over men's law, his causing men to bow down and worship him and to obey him, How could anyone confuse the Pope, the papacy, as a man of God? How could anyone confuse the Roman Catholic Church with a Christian church? But it's called Christian by the vast majority, the overwhelming majority, some would even say the lion's share of Christians today. They believe the Roman Catholic Church is a Christian church. The Pope is the greatest spiritual leader of the world. That's been accepted by all the other pagan religions of the world, too. On two different occasions, the papacy has gathered together with all the other religions of the world in a, in a grand ecumenical abomination and worshipped with him. Who was excluded? Protestants. They will never bend the knee to Baal. We will never worship with Antichrist. We have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, we reprove them. And it's very difficult to reprove them without identifying them. Henry Grattan Guinness identifies them and reproves them. That is our purpose as Protestants. Continuing, he says, observe here, that it is not asserted that the man of sin will say that he is God, but that he will show himself as such. Now, long ago, the papacy, as I stated previously, asserted in writing that the Pope is, as it were, God on earth. He is named Lord God the Pope in official Roman Catholic literature. He's universally regarded as the vicar of Christ. So while the Bible never says that he will say that he is God, he indeed has said that he is God in writing. Now, continuing, he says, the words are, quote, he as God sitting in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, unquote, or is divine, or a divine being. There's no article here before the name God. He's not a God. He is God, right? The expression indicates that the man of sin would show himself by acts and professions to be possessed of superhuman and divine dignity, authority, and power. If you continue to listen, especially to my program, Inquisition Update, every day, Monday through Friday, on First Amendment Radio, it's called Inquisition Update, I will give you the history that proves the papacy through his acts and professions to be possessed of superhuman, pretended superhuman and divine dignity, authority, and power. And it says in the Bible of him, even by his sorceries, He deceived the kings of the earth. What do you think the kings of the earth go to Rome to see? A doddering, slobbering old pope? 
or do they go to see superhuman and divine demonstrations of power, false miracles? Rome has made a career out of false miracles, just like Moses in the house of Pharaoh when his three magicians threw down their staffs. For all intents and purposes, they appeared to have the same power that Moses had. Yet Moses' serpent devoured all three. I assert that the kings of the earth accept the papacy and render obeyance to the papacy because his sorcerers show them false miracles. But one cannot deny all of the bleeding images and statues, those bleeding blood, those bleeding oil and weeping tears of oil, the false apparitions, the Marian apparitions, the lying deceptions all over the world that people believe in mass. These are not acts of God. These are manifestations of satanic power through the Roman Catholic Church. And I am not about to believe that the they don't save their best magic tricks for the po- for the presidents, the kings and the queens and the potentates of the earth when they come to visit the papacy. It's the greatest show on earth, but it's just a show, and it has deceived the whole world. Continuing, he says, observe the position of the man of sin. Notice the word sitteth and connect it with a seat, a word which occurs three times in the New Testament. It is used twice with reference to the seats and the temples of those who sold doves, who turned the house of God into a house of merchandise and a den of thieves, and once in the sentence, quote, the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, unquote. See, the Pharisees considered themselves to be the successors of Moses just as the popes consider themselves to be the successors of Peter. You see the similarity? Do you think, perhaps, as I do, that these words were chosen specifically for our understanding so that we would see the direct similitude between the Pharisees who believed they were successors of Moses and the popes who believed that they were successors of Peter? I'm convinced. Now it says from, and it gives a Latin word, which, or rather <clears throat> a Greek word, which I cannot read, but from this Greek word comes the word cathedral, the bishop's seat, and also the expression ex cathedra, as when we say the, spo- the pope speaks ex cathedra, or from his seat officially. There in that exalted cathedral position and claiming to represent God, the man of sin was to act and abide as the pretended vicar, but real antagonist of Christ, undermining his authority, abolishing his laws, and oppressing his people. Observe the words, quote, who opposeth, unquote. It is possible, effectually, to oppose another without being his avowed antagonist. So the professions of the predicted power might be friendly, while his actions would be those of an opponent of the gospel of Christ. Now let me tell you from personal experience. For years I talked about the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, the the Jesuits, the Protestant Reformation, the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation, and there were a continual succession of people who would participate in my discussion, pretending to be my friend, but secretly working to undermine the Protestant truth of what I was saying. I've seen it face-to-face. So I know whereof God speaks, and no one is more professed at appearing to be the friend of Christ while being his abject foe. 
that is the papacy. <clears throat> now, I see we've run out of time. We'll make a mark here, and we'll continue with this next Sunday. This is page 93. About halfway down the page, we'll stop here, make a mark, and we'll come back and return here next Sunday. By the way, in the meantime, if you want to hear more truth, listen to Inquisition Update Monday through Friday at www.firstamendmentradio.com. That's firstamendmentradio.com. The program airs Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Central Time. That's 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 Central, 9 Mountain, and 8 a.m. Pacific Coast Time. And if you appreciate the truth, the biblical, historical, and prophetic truth, send me an email at tom at seawaves.us. And I'll put you in my prayers as you put me in yours, and we'll continue to tell the truth until the trumpet sounds or God takes us home. It's been my blessing to be here today. I'm going to take a little break. We'll come back, and we'll have an hour of discussion. Again, my name's Tom Fress, hosting for Walt Stickle on Mystery Babylon News Radio. Thanks for listening. We'll be 